Okay, so this is part two of our malware analysis primer. And we're going to be talking about the stack and comparing it to the heap. So the slide that I have currently shows a picture of the stack. Of course, we have our two stack pointers, our two registers that we've spoken of, ESP and EBP. We know that ESP always points to the top of the stack. Now the stack is actually what's known as Philo or Philo. It's first in, last out. And what that means is as variables are declared and they come in visibility of the program, they get placed or pushed on top of the stack, which means the further you go up the stack, the further down those initial variables that were declared and, and initialized get pushed towards uh, the bottom. So now, generally speaking, we, we speak in terms of a function. So all of your local variables that you're declaring, they get created in, in your stack. And as the function goes through whatever segment of processing it needs to do, it's going to eventually terminate. And once it does, all of those variables get freed from the stack, and that's known as a pop. So you've got this constant push pop action going on with the stack. Now the thing about the stack is that the memory is managed for you, and that's that's nice. So you're, as the programmer, you don't have to worry about uh, actually allocating memory for this. Now this really, that statement is applicable for higher level languages like C. When we talk about assembly code, obviously we have to use these commands. So push and pop are actual assembly code commands that we're going to see in our program. And the EBP, that's the bottom half of our stack and that's going to point to your actual local variables. The other thing to remember with the stack is there is a limit on the size. So when you put values into your variables, you need to make sure that whatever you declare that variable to be, whether it's an integer, a long, a float, you need to make sure that, that the value you're trying to put in there, that it will actually fit. And this, the stack won't manage that for you. So, and of course, that's always gonna be dependent on the operating system you're running as far as the size. Now, the heap, the heap is, a uh, I like to think of the heap as a little bit hippier than the stack. It's hippie in the fact that it's free floating. So your heap can expand and contract as necessary. It's also not as strict about its level of visibility. So when you declare a variable outside of your functions, that variable is known as being global and global variables in the heap are visible throughout your whole program. So what I've done is on this slide, I have actually provided on the left-hand side some source code. We're going to be looking at the fourth line that shows int global var, and then it's set to a value. So this is an integer. We just set it to 22334455. And then we have a function, function sunny1 that receives in an int value as a parameter. It also has two local variables that are declared within it. One is a pointer. Uh, it's a pointer that's name is local var one, and it's pointing to the string function sunny one. And then we have the int, which is a local var two, and that is initialized to the value 55667788. Now, moving to the middle picture, we can see what goes on the stack. And so we've got our two local variables as we would expect, right? And specifically in the stack, we would look for them where in the EBP, right? So we've got a pointer at the top and I've got PTR for pointer in the circle. And the name of course is local var one. Now, I don't know if it's actually pointing to a particular address that I've given. I've made these numbers up, but basically you can realize that it's going to be some address location in memory. 
So I've given it a, a memory. Now the, the thing is, when you use pointers, uh, heap is actually going to be uh, using a pointer to, to look at that variable's uh, value. So pointers are a little bit different in that uh, there's a reference to them uh, instead of the actual value. Whereas if you look at the next example of our local variable int, we can actually see the value there because it's a primitive. So I'm giving an address location and I'm giving the actual value of 5566778. And, now the other thing I want you to notice in the heap is the global variable. So we had mentioned that in the source code and you can see it identified there in the heap. So now let's talk about opcode versus instruction code. Now opcode is basically the machine language command. So this is what the computer actually understands. Machine language, as we all know, is ones and zeros. So when it sees an instruction like 8BC3, what the CPU actually sees is 1000101111000011. So that is its language. Now, opcode, as you can imagine, is a lot harder for a human to understand. So there's one step higher to opcode, which is known as instruction code. And it's labeled a higher level representation of a command. And that's probably a pretty good definition for it. It's not a high level language. This is a low level language. And I'll talk about what that means in just a moment. But basically, if you take that uh, same instruction and you put it in assembly, which is really what we're talking about, then the instruction code actually becomes move EAX EBX. And the translation of that is everything that's on the right side actually gets assigned to what's on the left side of the comma. So whatever value has happened to be stored in EBX, it gets assigned into EAX. So as you can see, if you were to look at this in memory, you'd have some memory address location. I've randomly assigned it as 44332211. You'd have an opcode available there, which is our 8BC3. But then we would probably read the, the assembly instruction, which is the move EAX comma EBX. And that's what we were looking at also in the demo for part one when we did our disassemble and we actually changed the flavor to be Intel. So assembly language just really basically, it's a low level programming language, low level meaning very, very close to the CPU's machine language. It doesn't require a compiler. It, uh, it only needs what's called an assembler, which basically takes that higher level representation and then transforms it into what's known as an object code, does run it through a linker. A linker is responsible for adding in any libraries that might be included in that instruction, and then finally hands it off to the loader. And we talked about uh, the components to that when we looked at all the different components of the CPU. We said that there was a, a fetch, decode, and execute. And so that's kind of where all this comes into play. Now realize, um, as I showed you the different flavors that you can have for assembly language, each language is gonna be specific to a processor family. So you can have Intel, you can have ARM, you can have MIPS, etc. Okay, let's talk about debuggers. The goal of a debugger is basically to provide some sort of dynamic analysis of a process or your program as it's running. Now debuggers can view running processes in two different ways. Either they can open and execute a process or a program, or they can attach to an existing one. And in the, the um, demos that I'm gonna be showing to you, we will actually be attaching to an existing running program. So now let's talk about debug events. So 
essentially a debugger runs in an endless loop and so in order to capture sort of a snapshot in time of a running program you need to set a breakpoint now there are different types of breakpoints there's soft there's hard there's memory we're just going to talk about soft breakpoints because that's all we're going to do in our demos if you're interested in the other types i recommend that you uh, google for more information on them now uh, a debugger also can stop for other reasons there could be a, a memory access violation or maybe even an exception in the debugger itself and of course the program is going to eventually terminate. Now, the other thing I want to bring out are these event codes. And event codes are used to show threads, additional threads, additional process uh, IDs that are associated with the overall process. And they can also show when maybe a DLL is loaded. So I wanted you to be aware of their numbers because in the subsequent uh, demo that I'm about to show you, you're going to see these ID, you're going to see these event code IDs, and I wanted you to know what they mean. So a one is exception, two is to create a thread, and you're going to see a lot of threads. Uh, three is to create a process, four is to exit a, a thread, and five is to exit the process. Then of course six is this low DLL. A debug event. So for this next demo, I'm actually going to be running, first of all, my platform is going to be Windows XP 32-bit. I'm running this on VirtualBox. I will be using Notepad++ as my editor, and that's available for free. The ISO for Windows XP 32-bit is also available for free. VirtualBox is available for free, so you can get all these tools uh, online. Python 2.7 is the version of Python I'm going to be using. That is available for free as well. Now, I am going to be using a custom debugger that was written by the author of Gray Hat Python. So here we're going to do our next demo, and this is with the use of a custom debugger written by the author of Gray Hat Python. And basically, what we're going to do is attach to an existing process with this custom debugger that he wrote in Python. Now, before we do that, I wanted to just go through some of the source code so that you have a better understanding of what's happening. The first is this mydebuggerdefines.py. I'm going to open that in Notepad. I just wanted to basically show you this particular class down here called debug event. When we actually see the output, this is what we're going to be looking at. There's a debug event code, and I went through those one through six on the previous slide. There's a process ID, there's a thread ID, uh, and then there's this union that, that actually links it to some, some other class. So you'll, you'll be seeing that on the screen. Now, he also incorporates uh, this debugger class. This is the actual custom debugger that he wrote. And uh, I want to just identify this particular uh, definition here for the function attach. So attach is going to basically identify itself or make, it, make a reference to itself. It's also going to receive a PID or a process ID. And that process ID is what we're going to attach this debugger to so, so that we can uh, see it through uh, with with those debug event codes displayed. 